Great. So my talk today is talking about getting along with their DBOps team. And I think this should be fun. All right, so does anybody know what a DBA's favorite word is? No, exactly, right? <laughs> so I'm here to say that that's, that, that may be true for some, but it's, it shouldn't be true for all. Like this is, this is one of those things that I think that we can work to change the, the way that we portend ourselves to the engineering team and the way that the engineer, engineering teams work with us. So let's get started. Why do we care? It's a good question. Like why do we actually care that, that we actually include DBOps in our DevOps stuff? The answer is because your data is super important. We actually really care about your data a lot, which is why we say no a lot, because we think that you're trying to hurt yourself. That may or may not be true, but that's why we, that's why we care. We care so much that we just are like, listen, data integrity is the utmost thing that we care about. So I think that in order for you to kind of understand where we're coming from, we should try to set a common baseline or a common, a common platform for us to kind of think about what data is and what data means, what it means to us, and what we think uh, it should mean to the organization as a whole. So what does the DBOps team care about and how does it apply to dev? We're going to go back and talk about this concept called ACID. Does anybody know what ACID is? Raise, raise your hands. A couple hands, most, most of it. So it's basically what governs uh, the rules that govern a specific database. It's atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. These rules basically govern how data is stored and how data is able to be retrieved, how data is accessed, you know, basically just rules the data in general. So I thought that that would be a good way to, to kind of like lay the ground, uh, foundation of what data really means to us using something that we as DBOps guys can kind of relate to and then hopefully we can relate it back to dev. So atomicity. Atomicity, and I pulled these straight from Wikipedia because I'm really good at copy paste. Atomicity requires that each transaction be all or nothing. If one part of the transaction fails, then the entire transaction fails and the database state is left unchanged. An atomic system must guarantee atomicity in each and every situation, including power failures, errors, and crashes to the outside world. A committed transaction appears by its effects on the database to be indivisible and an aborted transaction does not happen. This is super important when you start to work with transactions in a database so that things that are committed are there, things that aren't committed aren't there, and your application can kind of understand the data as it sits because what's there is there, what's there isn't, and things that don't work aren't there. That's kind of important. So how does that kind of relate to DevOps, right? So the thing that I thought about is how can we kind of relate the atomicity concept? And the thing that I came up with was each code deployment involving a database must be successful and be progressive, not regressive. Obviously, you never want to do a code, a code deploy that regresses your data backwards. That just doesn't seem right. And in the event of a failure in the code deployment, the rollback must be transparent to the user. This is also important because if you, want, if you roll out some code to people and it changes data, and then you're like, oh, crap, this doesn't work. I got to roll this back. The last thing you want is your, your users to now say, oh, I see CA here instead of California. What does that mean? And now things are breaking because of that. So in this case, you know, when you roll something out, the idea is that each deployment then is kind of its own deploy at that point and kind of rolls forward each step, it's step, it's step, it's step, baby, you know, baby steps more or less. So you don't just do all of these things all at once and then say, oh crap, things are broken, now what do we do? It's you know, very small, very uh, iterative, de iterative deployments for your data. I think that's kind of sums up the atomicity part of it. Consistency. So consistency is the, the property ensures that any transaction will bring the database from one valid state to another. Any data written to the database must be valid according to all defined rules, including constraints, cascades, triggers, and any combination thereof. This does not guarantee correctness of the transaction in all ways. The application programmer might have wanted as a responsibility of the application level code, but merely, merely that any programming errors cannot result in the violation of any defined rules. So the way that I thought about this with DevOps, it's like, so that's basically you understand the underlying data you're trying to change with each code deploy. I think that's absolutely paramount that you, that you as the engineers and as ops people especially, understand what each code deploy is doing, right? So when you, when you go and you, you say, I'm going to insert this data into this column and we're going to call it bucket A. We all know what bucket A means. It's all very well, well defined. And then if you're like, okay, well, I'm gonna change bucket A to be kind of bucket A1. So again, making sure that you understand 
that each, each of your code deploys iterates on that specific code bucket, and from there you can kind of say, okay, I get that, and each one, each deploy that you do, it doesn't, uh, doesn't wreck or overwrite or kind of smush whatever is there, it kind of builds upon it and builds upon it and builds upon it. So make sure that the data structure you use and change are consistent with the ones currently in place. Keep data types similar for similar data. So if you use, uh, I use this, op, uh, this example because this actually happens to me a lot. When you come into a, a, new, a new table or a new company and you're looking at tables and you see in one place they're like, oh, we're gonna use timestamps here. Great, you're actually gonna use the actual database construct timestamp, fine. But then you go somewhere else and they're like, oh, we're gonna use date stamps here. And we're like, well, why don't you use, just use timestamps here if you try to do the same thing? And they're like, well, that's fine. We're gonna actually use Unix stamps here with ints. Okay, but now, but now you're trying to manage three different types of data structures for the same exact data at the end of the day. And while, while, while that may be okay for your application because you're, 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 uh, you're coding these things as little, as little code deploys and little iterative changes and each one is like, oh, this needs a date, I'm gonna use ints here. Oh, this needs a date, I'm gonna use timestamps here. From a DBA's perspective, that's really hard to manage at the end of the day. It's really frustrating when you're, when you're like, oh, well, here I need to do a function to convert the instance so I can do a compare here, but at the same time, over here, I can just use the straight timestamp. It makes it hard to, to, to manage that. And I can't even imagine what it be, must be like when you're writing code to try to code against four different types of timestamps all in one query. That just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So it's just about uh, keeping things consistent from start to finish uh, as much as you can, uh, as much as, as, as it makes sense. Uh, you'll make everybody's lives easier. Isolation. So this is, a, this is a property of the database that basically ensures that, that the concurrent exec execution of transactions results in a system state that would be obtained if transactions were executed serially, i.e. one after the other. Providing isolation is the main goal of concurrency control. And the rest of that is there. And the, what the, the thing that I thought about this was mostly with uh, iterative code deploys, right? So when doing a code deploy, always be on the same page with the way the data is going to be changed. We get this a lot when we're dealing with, with developers who are moving at a million miles a second. You know, iterating, deploying, iterating, deploying, iterating, deploying. But at the same time, you may have a cohort or a colleague who's doing the same thing on their side, iterating, deploying, iterating, deploying. And all of a sudden, you come into this weird thing where it's like, this guy's doing the same thing with this column, this guy's doing the thing with another column, and now you're overriding other people's work, more or less. So, and then at the end of the day, they look at the data, the DBA, and they say, well, fix it. And that's a little bit hard to do. So this is one of the things that you can, you can kind of help the DB ops team by saying, we're going to make sure that what we do doesn't mess up other people's stuff, number one. And number two, that we're always mindful of what the data is and what we're trying to accomplish with that data and we don't overwrite something that should be there. Durability is the last one for ACID. So durability is the property that ensures that once a transaction has been committed, it will remain so even in the event of a power loss, crash, errors. In a relational database, for instance, once a group of SQL statements execute, the results need to be stored permanently, even if the database crashes immediately thereafter. To defend against power loss, the transactions must be recorded in, in non-volatile memory. So the way that I thought about this was, okay, so if we understand the mechanics of the durability property of the database, if you're not using a truly ACID database, you may have to program in checks to ensure the data is stored and retrievable correctly, even in the event of a connection or system failure. Uh, having retries in, you know, if you, for whatever reason, the, the database handle drops. Being able to insert something in and then check to make sure that that actually is there, uh, that that specific element is there. Uh, so that what happens is if you don't do the checks and all of a sudden you start ins inserting things that you may just be, be making assumptions on, that can cause issues with data integrity. And then again, that goes back to, well now the DBA has to step in and kind of fix the data that's there, working with the engineers to try to figure out what's wrong and how, and how to either roll back or migrate or fix what's, what needs to be fixed. So now that we kind of covered that, I'm gonna kind of go through some things that I like to call in practice items. I hate saying best practice because every, every, every company is different and it's hard to just say hard and fast rule, this has to look like this. And even within DBAs, you get, you get kind of quarrels about what needs to go look one way or what needs to look another way, which database engine is best. I'm not even gonna get, I'm not even gonna get into that. So in practice, around your schema, this will help when you start to work with your DBOps team to kind, of, to kind of get on the same page, right? 
So the first thing, and I think the most important thing, is to know your data. Know what you're storing, know what you're, what you're trying to accomplish, know your data inside and out, and then be passionate about it, right? The last thing that the DBA wants to do is to deal with engineers who are just like, oh, I'm gonna throw this here, oh, I'm gonna throw this there. No, be passionate about your data, be very intentional about your data. Know what you need to do, and then do it in a way that, that makes everybody's lives easier. If you just kind of off the cuff start storing things, you may wind up with scalability issues, you may wind up with certain, uh, certain data retrieval issues, you know, you may have to start to program in your app different rules and conversions, you know, just be passionate about your data and know what you're storing. I think that's super, super important. If your database uses them, explicit primary keys. I think, hands down for me, when I came into my current organization, there were a lot of tables that didn't have primary keys, which you're like, well, how does a database work if it doesn't have primary keys? Well, the database, nine times out of 10, will actually go and just assume a primary key if you can, just be more explicit about it, just actually name your primary key. At that point, people will know what it is when they start to look and review your, your schemas and look, review your tables. That makes everybody's life easier and it makes maintenance on the table easy. One thing to also note about primary keys, and this may kind of get into the more ideological thing, but in my belief, I believe that primary keys should not be application specific, should not be named anything application specific, because what happens if you change that notion of the table? Well, now you have to rename your primary key, you have to store, maybe possibly even change the data that's in there for the primary key. And so I always say, listen, it's easy enough, the database has something built in for it, whether you use GUIDs, UIDs, auto increment IDs, just call it an ID field or a GUID field and, and just call it a day. After that, just start storing your data like you normally would, but as long as you have a primary key, that can be referenced back, I think that's gonna make everybody's life super easy, or much more easy. Correctly sized data fields. This is something that I get involved with a lot. So if you need you know, a field to store an address, what you don't need is a text field, right? You need a, a, either a, a specifically sized field for whatever length you wanna store it, whether it's a car, var car, or whatever, but know what size, know the data that you wanna store, and know the size of that data. Understand your min-max for these things so that you can, you can help the DBA kind of size these correctly. So if you say, I'm gonna store usernames, and if we say, oh, how long can usernames be? You know, it can be 50 characters long, or 255, or whatever that is. As long as you have an idea, that will help the DBA kind of understand the data you're trying to store and understand what you're trying to do, and it will make your, your life and make everybody's uh, storage more efficient. Be able to forecast growth patterns. So this is a challenge, this is always kind of challenging when you say, I'm gonna put a new table out, it's a new product, we don't know how many people are gonna hit it, but it's gonna grow. If you have some sort of an idea of how, how large it's gonna grow, the DBA or the DBOps team can kind of, kind of assume certain things and then say, you know, maybe we need to split this up into two different tables, or maybe we need to think about this idea, this concept, a little bit differently, a little bit more, uh, more, scale, more scale oriented. Or if you know that it's just not gonna scale at all, you can just say, oh, this is, you know, going to be five roads, five records, and it's never going to grow. But just having that idea and knowing your product and knowing what you're trying to roll out, I think it, it gives you a better, it shows that you care about your data, it shows that you care about your data, and it shows that you care about the work that you're doing, and I think the, the DBOps team will respect that. I, I certainly do with, with my guys when I work with them. Consistent naming conventions. This is also one that kills me. When you come into a place and they're like, we're gonna use lowercase here, camel case over here, underscores over here, we're gonna call things full, full words here, but then abbreviate over here. Table names are our own, who knows what, maybe they're numbers, maybe they're a sequence of letters. I, I mean, just be consistent. If you're gonna be confusing, be confusing consistently so that at least that everybody understands that. But it's, it's just one of the things where, like, if, if no one has that base of what things are supposed to be called, you have no reference of when you're reading through a schema or reading through your code, where you're supposed to store things. And as a, D, as a DBOps guy, you go and you look at and you're like, I don't know what IDNT means. Is that identity? Or is that ID int? Is that, I, I, you know, you just don't know. So if you, if you agree on a consistent naming convention from the start, or you work on, on porting and moving things and renaming columns so that you get to a point that makes the most sense. Because at the end of the day, it's all about making sense for everybody. People who read your code, 
the people who manage your data, the people who come behind you because, you know, it's, I always say it's all about leaving a legacy at whatever place you are, right? You don't want people to come in and be like, oh, frickin' Nick, he doesn't know what he's doing. He came in here and he called something this and this and that. You want to leave a legacy. You want to leave the work in the workspace better than you left it. And I think that having, having a good policy around consistent naming conventions just makes it easier for someone to read through and understand what you're trying to do and what you're really trying to accomplish. Understand storage conventions of the database engine. This is also pretty important, uh, mostly around, you know, or around like uh, no SQL versus relational ACID compliant databases, but also more along the lines of whether you're storing stuff compressed, whether you're storing stuff you know, in a huge wide table with you know, 20 var cars and 10 cars and, and a binary blob field, don't do that. Uh, there, are, there, are, there are things that you just need to understand in terms of like how, la how large can, can my row be? How much is each row gonna take up when I try to store this? What is it, how, how does that factor into re re uh, returning that value and that data when you actually go to do that? I think that's, that's you know, again, that, that kind of goes back to knowing your data and understanding your data and knowing what you're doing in order to, to store, that, to store the, uh, that information. This is a bonus. I really like it when my guys come back with this. Example queries with explain paths. It's not that hard to run and explain uh, on whatever information that you're, you're querying, whether it's on your local, uh, local database or whether it's on staging or whether it's on development. It's easy enough to just say, hey, we're just gonna run an example uh, just to, so that we understand how the data is actually being retrieved. Because the more you understand how your data is being retrieved and how it's being searched for and how it's being queried and how the optimizer of your engine that you're using likes to see the data, the more efficient you're going to be when returning that data, which in turn means happier customers, happier clients. So again, it's, it's a nice to have. I always like it. It makes me smile inside. I like it. So in practice, DBA stuff. So we're gonna talk about continuous deployment of code, have a system and agreement in place. So when you start deploying code, especially in a continuous deployment environment, code is iteratively put in right away into production, right? So you, you commit it, it's deployed. You commit it, it's deployed. You commit it, it's deployed. And a lot of times, what I've, what I've heard is a lot of people don't actually take the time to, to bring the DB ops guys in at the very beginning. So by the time it's ready to be deployed, you deploy it out, it breaks something, DB ops has to get involved, and then you have to roll something back. At this, you know, I, I just think that it's better to talk about your system Talk about how you're going to be deploying these things. Talk about the, about the iterations that you're trying to go through to deploy these codes, and then bring your database guys in early. Bring them in early and often. Talk to the database guys about what you're trying to do, what you're trying, even if it's just like, I need to check something in here, it's going to put, push an update over here. Does this make sense? Is this same? Just to get feedback on it, you know? And then you start to you have this conversation, and you can start to build a working agreement, right? The working agreement is, hey, I'm going to deploy code. If I have something that has to do with databases, I come to you, I talk to you guys, you guys say yes or no, we kind of go from there. Whether it's informal or formal, tracked or untracked, just having that conversation, I think is an absolutely important start. Audit and change management. This is, this is actually really important, I think, especially in, 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 co in companies that are moving forward and iterating at a very high pace, right? So as you start to make changes and as you start to, uh, as you start to kind of go through and, and run your alter statements and run your whatever, what have you, being able to track back how the changes were done, when they were done, how they were rolled out, and if you're lucky, you have a system in place that automatically does that for you, right? You check in, it says, hey, this has SQL in it, I'm gonna package it up, I'm gonna roll it out, and then people can go back and say, hey, this broke something, let's go back to the engineer, let's talk to them, and then you can get people on board faster than you would if you just kind of throw stuff over the wall to, to the database. Audit and change management, I know that there are a lot of tools out there. Um, I forgot the name of your tool. Sorry? I, 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 I can't hear. Anyways, there's a guy over here, raise your hand. He's got a product that does that, that's good. Liquid Base is another good one that, I, that I've used in the past uh, and, I, and I really recommend that one. Uh, 
It just tracks everything. Roll forwards, roll backs are important as well, not just rolling forward. So when you go and you create a script to do X, Y, or Z in your, in your database, being able to roll that change back, I think is almost equally as important, if not more important, than the roll forward, because you always have to be prepared for things that are going to break, because nothing is ever perfect. Things will break. It's just a matter of how do you recover from that, whether you roll forward, whether you have a plan to say, if this breaks, then we're going to migrate some data around and get that fixed. Having that, that information there, I think is going to be incredibly, incredibly useful. Data migration plans is kind of on the same note, cause and, with cause and effect analysis. So if you're, if you're going through and you say, okay, we have this new product that's, kind of going, to, that's going to be rolling out and we're going to do, you're gonna change a thousand or a million columns here, a million rows that have this data that looks this way, and now we're gonna move it, and we're gonna make it look this way. Having a very clear plan of how you're going to go about deploying that is a very good idea. Whether that, you know, whether you go step by step, like I push the, the code deploy button, the SQL runs, we check and we test to make sure that the data looks okay. We roll code out that now depends on that data. And we check to make sure that the application works okay. We call it good. If something breaks, we go back and we say, okay, where, does it, where did it break? How do we fix that? And we kind of go from there. But having that plan in place gets you prepared for whatever may or may not happen. Sure, it could go absolutely perfect. You could roll something out and nothing breaks. But it's just a matter of what if, right? And the last thing that the DB ops team wants to do is try to troubleshoot your deployment halfway through a deploy if it's broken. We just want to be on the same page. We want to know exactly what you expect so that we know what to expect, so that we know how to fix it if we need to get involved. Rapid deployment infrastructure. So this one is more along the lines of having a pipeline that goes from development through staging QA into production. Uh, we have a joke at my company where we say, I don't always text my, text my code, but when I do, I do it in production. And we all kind of laugh and we giggle about it, but then we say, oh, you know, we really shouldn't be doing that. Shouldn't be doing that. So have a good pipeline in place, you know, whether you say we, we deploy manually to these places or whether we have it as part of the tool, the, uh, tool, the tool chain. Just have a very explicit pipeline that goes from development to staging to production so you can catch whatever you need to catch from a data perspective sooner than if you would just roll it out. Backups and restores. Uh, test often. So how many people have backups here? How many people test them? Okay. How many test them more than once a month? Okay. How many test them more than once, once every two weeks? Daily? Yeah, daily. That's what it should be, right? The last thing you want to do is go through a backup process, have something fail catastrophically, and say, I need to rebuild. You go to your rebuild, and you say, well, we've been taking backups, but they just don't work. Now what do you do? It's a good question. So backups, test them early, often. If you can, use them in your tool, in your, uh, tool chain, in your pipeline, right? Restore to a state, use that to restore to staging every night. Put that out there, make sure that the data looks okay, and go from there. You know, there's a lot, it does take a lot of work, and it sucks to do all that hard work just to, for something that doesn't actually affect production and will only affect production in a catastrophic failure, but in the event that it does happen, that's gonna make things a lot easier. So the thing that I would say is backups restore and, uh, early and often. So now that you have kind of a baseline of what we're kind of looking for from a DB ops team, now let's talk about actually getting along with them. Getting along with DB ops, I think, is not as difficult as a lot of people may, may think. Database ops, guys, we're very, um, do we have any other DBAs here? One. I think that's indicative of how we interact with each other, right? We don't. And I think that's the, I think that's the key part of this whole conference is we're talking about how to get dev and ops to kind of talk to each other, but we always forget about DB ops because they're off in their corner being grumpy old people saying, no, 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 you can't do that, you can't do that, you can't do that. But I think that, and I believe that, if you start to bring people in early into the process, more often than not, you'll start to have a conversation instead of conflict. And so the first thing that you, you should probably do is buy into the same goals, right? If you go to your DB ops guy and you say, what is your main goal? And he says, data integrity. 
That's well and good. If you go to your engineering team and they say, what's your main goal? It's delivering features to users, delivering software. And you talk about to ops, what's your main goal? It's availability. Those are all three very disparate goals for each specific department, but they, at the end of the day, they're all trying to do the same thing. We're trying to get value for our users, whether it's availability, whether it's new features, whether it's just having the data there and working. So buying into the same goal, I think, is absolutely paramount from the very beginning. You get people involved, have discussions with them, find out what they value and how they value it, and then try to work into a way that you can say, listen, this is what we're trying to accomplish as an organization. This is what we're trying to do. This is what we're all trying to get behind. And at, at that point, once everybody buys into that goal, you can kind of, it makes that conversation a little bit easier about, well, if I have to give up this, then another person gives up this, and another person gives up that, just because it's all for the common good. Sounds a little communistic and socialistic, but that's fine. Communicate early and often. This is one of the things that I stress so hard with my engineers that I work with. From the very, very beginning, it's you, you, you come to me if you say, hey, I have a table that I want to do something with. It doesn't matter what it is. I think it should look like this. We as a database ops team can say, okay, it's great that you have this feature in mind. Have you thought about doing something over here or making it look like this? Have you thought about maybe storing in a different way, you can start to create a conversation that not only may or may not make your life easier, but also will make the DB Ops guys easier, uh, life easier as well. Right, so that way it's not just, I'm throwing code over the wall, the DB Ops guy picks it up, says no, throws it back, you pick it back up, say, oh, well, I'm gonna do this, throw it back. It, it, it kind of shortcuts that whole conflict and that whole situation right from the beginning. So that you realize that you're both, again, you're both on the same team, Let's work to, to get this solution out the door for the user. Be ready to compromise. And I say this more for myself than I do for engineers. We're very good at saying no. But at the same time, engineers and database guys, once they get together, have to be willing to compromise certain things. When I went to my engineering team, I said, I want to see all schemas look like this. And I gave them a long list of examples of how I want to see things named how I want to see things uh, documented, how I want to do all these things. And they said, that's fine, we just don't have a lot of time for that. I said, okay, so what do you have time for? What are the things that you think that you can do and accomplish? And we can kind of set roadmaps from there to get things, to get things done. And so it became a back and forth conversation of, uh, I, want all, I want to have tickets for every single query that goes to production in terms of like inserts, updates, and deletes. And they said, no, not possible. And I said, okay, well, what about we say all major code releases get ticketed and tracked, not necessarily in a I approve or disapprove, but in a way that we can look it up later and say, this is the process and this is the thing that may or may not have broken something. And then we can kind of adjust from there. So getting your baseline set, be willing to compromise on those baselines just to get the ball moving. Because if no one gives anything, you're never gonna move. You're never gonna get any kind of forward progress and you're never gonna get any any improvement or any, any development. So being, being able to compromise at a very base level and then kind of build from there, again, this all goes back to buying into the same goals and having that conversation where it actually is truly a conversation and not a conflict that you can actually get stuff done and, and kind of build your platform up to a point where it is mutually agreeable for every party as well as keeping stuff, keeping stuff done. Be able to define stakeholders for each data release. I think this is actually super important as well. So when an engineer says, I need to create a table that looks like this, and I need it, and I just need it. Being able to go back and say, okay, what is, who exactly is asking for this table, and what are they trying to solve from it? Because your idea of engineering may be different than what the data, the data guys see as being the solution for the problem. And being able to define the stakeholder lets you then circle back and say, okay, data guy says that we should go like this, we think we should go like this, how is that gonna solve the end goal for the user? You know, and working with your product team, working with your, with whomever you have that kind of defines that, I think is super important as well. So being able to define your stakeholders for each data release. Be accountable. How many people here are on a pager duty or on call duty? How many people wish they weren't? Yeah, it's about the same amount. So the idea though is that when you release something, it's not just throwing stuff over the wall. 
It's not just saying, hey, I'm just going to release and we're done. It's saying, I release something, I'm accountable for it. And so when we, ever, when we have a release at my, at my place, we say, all right, we're push, pushing stuff out for this release. You're on call for the next eight hours. If we have any issues with whatever you pushed out, we're going to call you. We're, gonna, we're going to have you answer questions so that we know what's going on and you can help explain it because I didn't make the code, but I want to help you help me understand it. So just be accountable and show that you care about your code after it's left your, your, your desktop or your laptop. I think that's actually, that goes, I think that's just a good practice to do regardless of whether it's, your, whether it's data or not. But especially in working with your database team who, again, may not know the code behind it and may have trouble trying to figure and sleuthing where things are at that point. Team, we're on the same team, and I can't stress this enough, you know, and I get, I get a lot of pushback around being warm and fuzzy about this stuff, but I cannot stress this enough. At the end of the day, we are all on the same team. If you put something out and it breaks, then we're all going to be working on it. If I push something out and it breaks, then we're all going to be working on it. You know, and if you push something out and it doesn't break and everything's great, we're all going to celebrate in that success. But it's just about being on the same team and understanding that we're all here for the same goal. We're all here to, to get value for our stakeholders and get value for our users. And I think that's where the conversation really needs to start is to say we're not separate teams. Like we're not this ops team and we're not this dev team and we're not this DB ops team. It's, everybody's all working together. We're all a team. We all just have different roles. I think that's kind of the main thing there. So, what if you are the DBOps team and everything else? I think that's kind of a legitimate, uh, a legitimate situation where you are literally everything. I don't know, does, is anybody here that person? Okay, we have one or two. So this may, may not apply. But again, it just starts to the, to the same thing. So troubleshooting tips for your data. Have explained plans, know what you're getting into, uh, Know how to, fix, how to fix your issues when you start to deploy them if you, if you kind of run across these things. Um, it's kind of plan for everything. For, so for Mongo, it's DB collection, dot find, explain. MySQL Postgres is explain select. Second thing is monitor everything, like everything. I can't stress that, that enough as well. If you can easily trace back where the, your failures are happening, you can kind of get to a point where you can quickly and easily kind of show what is, what's going wrong. And there are a lot of really good, good tools out there. Uh, I like New Relic personally, uh, but there are a lot of other really, really good uh, tools out there. Just make sure that you monitor everything, just top to bottom, uh, and then alert on those things. And then be smart about your alerts. The last thing that you want is to get paged out for, you know, a disk that's filled up to 80%. That's not very smart if you get woken up at 2 a.m. for that. So be smart about your alerts, be smart about, your, about how you page out, and be, you know, just be able to monitor everything. Practice your deploys on a staging environment. If you don't know how things are going to work out, don't just deploy to production, put it into a staging environment. Uh, I don't know, I, again, I'm speaking from experience of working with engineers who have just kind of rolled stuff out and expected stuff to work. And while well, that's all well and good, sometimes it doesn't. And then you kind of say, well, why didn't you practice? Why didn't you, why didn't you put this on a staging? And they say, well, we just didn't have time. The user was asking for this. Uh, the exec was asking for this. It was stopping revenue. You know, there's, it's always better to take the time to do it correctly than to try to go back and try to fix the things that are going wrong, that, as I've seen, at least, where you spend more time and more energy trying to fix your mistake than it would, take, would be to just find that mistake on a staging environment before you actually roll to production. And then aside from that, automation is key. So I know that DevOps really drives home automation, and I'm going to drive home automation as well. Automation is key for you know, up and down your stack, whether you're deploying to production, whether you're deploying to staging, whether you're deploying like all these things that we've talked about uh, from the, the deploy process, from the maintenance process. If you can automate those tasks, if you can automate those tasks, I mean, that is what makes life 100 times easier, and it makes a lot of these seemingly hard requirements and hard bullet points to kind of hit, it makes it easier to actually hit without causing a lot of heartburn and a lot of stress. 
And again, it, it is tough to kind of get going at the very beginning, but the payoff is much better at the end. I think everybody understands that. So, I mean, I, have, I think I have five minutes left. So at this point, I'm pretty much done with slides, so I'll take questions if anybody has questions. Anybody want to talk about databases or data? Because I do. <laughs> anybody want to hear some SQL jokes? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. All right. So I was told that people like jokes. Uh, on what day did God create the DBA? See, fitting we're in a church. No, it was actually the day before he got his rights revoked. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyways, uh, second one is uh, two MySQL database, uh, data, database engineers walk into a NoSQL bar, but they have to leave because there were no tables. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, I think that's it for me. I've got about five minutes left unless anybody wants to talk about data. I'm good. Anybody? I talked a little faster than what I practiced, so I apologize. Yeah. In, in what you were doing there, um, what do you do around source control? Source control. So uh, in terms of like having SQL with source control or having like al like alters and change versioning. 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 Yeah, so it, I think it really depends on what your team is capable of doing. I would always recommend putting it into some sort of, at the very, very, very least, some sort of a Git repository, right? Just so that you have that schema there, your statements there, and finding whatever way it's going to work. Again, with Liquidbase, you can check that, those changes in and have that actually tracked and versioned, and you can see who's doing stuff and who's not, you know, who deployed stuff. Uh, Liquidbase is good. I, um, other than that, I would just say at least check it into some sort of a Git repo or source control, uh, just so you have it. Uh, I'm a huge fan of documentation. Uh, that doesn't mean that I don't I actually do it, but I'm a huge fan of documentation. So if you can document your schema and actually have it mapped out for people to read and understand, you'll make it easier for them to start to make changes and track those changes in the document as well as in source control. Yep, so uh, they asked about automation and what that looks like for me. So what that looks like for me is, again, with Liquidbase, you can start to basically call Liquidbase using a Java process to deploy your stuff to different, uh, whatever nodes you need to deploy it to. So you check something in, it gets pushed and merged in. You can then call Liquidbase to deploy it for you. It, it's, it's not so much uh, hands-free automation, but it's more along the lines of push-button automation, if that makes sense. All right. I think that's it. Thank you very much.